Okay, well, welcome everybody um, to our webinar today. Um, we're really excited to be bringing you this webinar on intergenerational storytelling during Global Intergenerational Week, which of course celebrates intergenerational programs from all over the world. So if we could just go on to the next slide. Thanks, Georgie. So firstly, um, in the spirit of reconciliation, Bolton Clark acknowledges all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognises their connection to land, sea, culture and community. And we pay our respect to elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Okay, just a very quick bit of housekeeping. Um, all of the attendees will have your microphones um, on mute and your videos will be turned off. Um, if you have any questions um, and want to get involved in the Q&A, which will be at the end of the session, please pop your questions in the chat and we will address those in the Q&A session. So happy for you to pop those questions in as the speakers are giving their presentations, but we'll come back to them at the Q&A session at the end. Also, there'll be recordings of the presentations made available to all attendees um, via the Bolton Clark website, and you'll receive a link to those recordings after the presentations today. So my name is Xanthi Golenko and I'm a research fellow with the Bolton Clark Research Institute and I'm also leading our SHARE program. So SHARE stands for Storytelling in Health and Aged Care Research and Education. And I'd also just like to acknowledge the incredible team that I'm working with on this program from Bolton Clark Research Institute. So our Head of Research, Professor Judy Lothian, also team members, Dr. Ashmita Mancha and Georgina Johnson. So thank you um, for your incredible work that you do. Um, over the past three webinars in this series, we've talked about different aspects of storytelling, including the first one was about empowering the older adults to share their stories, so really amplifying their voices. The second webinar was about group storytelling and group work. Um, and the last one we did only a couple of months ago was around the role of storytelling in transforming future health and aged care workforce by involving university students from a range of different health disciplines in storytelling programs. So if you missed any of these presentations and would like to see them, please visit the Bolton Clark website um, and you'll be able to find the recordings of those there. Now, today's webinar, sadly, is actually the last in this series. Um, however, we are planning on doing a new series of webinars, which will be around creative arts and ageing. And these will probably start a little bit later in the year. So please keep an eye out for those if that's an area that you're interested in as well. So in the previous webinars, we've seen the benefits of storytelling for older adults, staff and university students. And today we're adding another dimension, which is the intergenerational component. So by using storytelling to bring older adults together with children and young people, we can achieve a range of additional benefits for individuals as well as communities. So some of these are like preserving cultural heritage. So by sharing stories across the generation, we can preserve preserve cultural heritage and pass this um, information and wisdom on to future generations. We can, they can be used to strengthen bonds between the generations. So sharing those stories across the generations um, create opportunities for meaningful interactions and shared experiences. It can promote empathy and understanding um, between the generations by allowing people to see things from different perspectives and learn from each other's experience. It can also enhance cognitive development. Um, so using storytelling to improve language and liter literacy skills, encouraging creativity and pro promoting problem solving and critical thinking. And of course, it can also improve mental health. So storytelling can be therapeutic and help people to express emotions, relieve stress and build resilience. 
So we have a wonderful lineup of speakers today. Very, very exciting. Um, first of all, I'm going to pass over to Associate Professor Katrina Radford from Griffith University, who's going to give an introduction and also um, some information about where you can access some resources. I've also got um, Cassandra from Faith Lutheran College, who's, who's going to, with some students, um, some year seven, well, the year eight students now, who are going to talk about a program that we did at their school. Um, I've also got Gwen Rayner, who is going to talk about a wonderful program that she's been doing with younger children. Um, I've also got Wendy Lawrence, who is a facilitator in intergenerational practice, and she's going to give you some information about you know, tips and tricks and challenges about being a facilitator. And also she's been doing some work in that virtual format. And last of all, we have Mark Silva and the team from PADSIP who are going to talk about their experience with their incredible program. Um, so without any further delays, I'm going to pass over to Katrina Radford. Now, Katrina couldn't be here today, so she's actually recorded her presentation. So we'll share that now. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and thank you for having me here today. Um, particular thank you to Xanthi for inviting me along to speak and talk about intergenerational practice. It is a passion of mine, and I'd love to talk to you about past, present, and the way forward for Australia. Sorry I can't be there today. Unfortunately, I have to teach at the same time as this symposium, but I'm so excited to present on this topic. So thank you for allowing me the space to um, virtually be there. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country in which we land here today. I'm on the um, Joe, on the Turbal and the Yuggera tribes here in Brisbane, and I'd like to pay my respect to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today, either virtually in person or around you in this space. So intergenerational practice is the coming together of two or more generations for a common purpose. That means that it could be any version of these generations. It might be adolescents and older people or children under the age of five and older people. It might be babies and older people or even babies and grandparents, which are that younger years around 55 plus. It might be children aged six to 12 and older people. It might be daycare centres involving both young and old people together. It might even be where there's a community centre and that community centre is the space that everyone comes to do a session, whether that is um, parents, children, any other um, older people in the community, whatever that looks like, it just has two or more generations coming together. Intergenerational practice is excitingly growing in Australia. When we started this research in 2014, we could not count any formal program in Australia, and now there are over 70 programs. How exciting is that? Um, what we know about intergenerational practice is that it is on a scale. So there's sessions where there's a low level of contact, where basically the people are just learning about other generations. And it might be that you've got an older person coming in telling us about how it was in their day. Um, it might be a younger person telling an older people about life today very low levels of contact to the extreme where there's high levels of contact in an intergenerational community centre where they're all together for a certain purpose over a period of time. Now let's unpack some of those. So other low level um, contacts are seeing the other age group but at a distance. So this is where childcare centres may bring in children to perform for older people in residential aged care or they might write letters or they might share artwork with each other. Um, the idea is that they... There is that distance between them, but they are still transferring knowledge. There might be meetings of each other, and it might be that students are visiting a nursing home as a one-off event, or they might come together for an arts event in the community. There might be annual or periodic events, such as Christmas events or Grandparents' Day, where the community is invited into institution, whether that's a school, childcare centre or an aged care centre. There might be demonstration programs, which a lot of us are doing, and they're trials of these programs. They're, they're at a particular point of time, so it might be 10 weeks, 12 weeks, whatever it is that that defined period of time is. But what they're doing is they're sharing that knowledge over that period of time for a purpose. There might be ongoing intergenerational programs where schools continually come into older adult um, centres or they might bring older adults into their centre on an ongoing basis. It might be that Betty reads at 10am every Wednesday, or it might be John comes in and helps out with gross murder 
on every Thursday at nine o'clock in the preppy area. And then, the, like I said before, there's that intergenerational community where everyone is invited in. Um, so there's a range of what intergenerational practice looks like, and I encourage you to embrace what that means for you. There is no one right model, and that's important. As we go forward today, I want you to really think about what you can do. The important part is that there's that duality of learning between two or more generations. One is not overpowering the others. One's not just celebrating the other. There is that knowledge transfer, and that's really important. To get an intergenerational program up, there are facilities and boundaries, uh, barriers, sorry, and I'd like to talk to you about these slightly. So the first facilitator I would really encourage is to find that person, and it might be you. You are that committed employee or volunteer that just makes this happen. Without you or that person, these programs don't work. So embrace yourself and embrace that passion and go ahead with it. The other facilitator is this sense of purpose. So when you're connecting with another organisation or another um, program, you need to find out what your purpose is and you need to have a clear outcome because both parties have to benefit from this. It's not a one-way street. The sustainability of the program needs to really be thought about. So how do we embed this within the community ongoing? How do we fund this ongoing? We can get seed investments. We can. The government will give you some money. The councillors will give us money. There's um, Anzac Day ceremonies, which are a great way of connecting generations. There are all sorts of um, funding that's out there for little bits of money everywhere. But what I want you to do is think about how do we move this forward? If we're truly going to be intergenerational practice facilitators or intergenerational practice owners, um, embraces, how do we move this forward? How do we partner with others? And the partnership of these programs are so important to move this forward. Quickly, the barriers to this program include logistics. So transport arrangements and costs are often the highest cost factor in your program. So you need to think about that. You need to think about the time that it takes to do these programs. The, how do we get the volunteers? How do we plan for these? How do we safeguard everyone in these programs? While you don't need blue cards for everyone, should we have them? I encourage you all to have them, but that also comes with a whole lot of planning. And lastly, we know that the evidence exists, but and it's growing. Socially, behaviourally, we know that this matters. And I want to go through some of our findings over the last um, nine years now. So in terms of older people in early childhood, we know that all the programs have to be mutually beneficial. Children will tap out. Older people will tap out or they won't come back for a second program. Right? We need to make sure that when we're creating these programs, they're co-designed. We have training that works. We have resources at hand. We have the involvement of parents, community centres and aged care facilitated facilities. One of the most heartbreaking findings that I consistently see is that there are always one or two people in these programs, both children and older adults, where their families don't support. And that means that these people often have the greatest development that they could have in that period of time, but no one cares. We care, and that's important to them, but you need to involve them and their loved ones. We know for older people, these programs do reduce the isolation and loneliness, but it also means that we need to think about the participants in these programs. We know that our programs have improved well-being, they've improved their mood, they've improved their quality of life and their mental and physical health, um, and their ability to access services, opening the door to have a conversation into where to next is, has been a great outcome of us. For children, we know that these programs do build confidence and self-esteem. We know that behaviourally they change in a good way. Uh, they've got mentors and supports. We know that they develop their skills and they not develop their knowledge. For adolescents, we've seen that they improve their knowledge, but really they improve their empathy and their help-seeking behaviour. In fact, going out in a community, if they see an older people, um, person in the community, they're more likely to offer help and be more helpful. We know that it reduces their ageism attitudes and it improves their attitudes towards older people. And from a community perspective, we know that they improve community cohesion and connectedness. Particularly in rural and remote, what we've seen is that connect, um, communities come together to help each other more with these programs than if they didn't. We know that it reduces community tensions and that we increase our sense of belonging to the community as we go forward. But there's lots of stuff we don't know. We don't know how staff are best recruited. We don't know how we sustain the program 
as an ongoing thing. We know that pre-COVID, um, it cost about $8 for a shared campus model and $7.50 for a visiting model per session. But what we don't know is how that's changed moving forward. So there needs to be further work in the economic space. We don't know how to attract people or even um, go out and see those people that are socially isolated. How do we get there? And we don't quite know the inclusion and exclusion criteria required to get the best participants and the best impact I mean by that. But what we do know is that there's lots of resources out to help. In 2021, uh, the Australian Institute of Intergenerational Practice was formed, led by Professor Annika Fitzgerald, and we now provides training courses for you. There's also um, in 2022, so last year, I authored a children's book because what we found in the children's space was that the kids were not prepared for the language and just to reduce their anxiety to what they might happen in the space, um, we created the series My Grand Friends Are Coming. That's available on Amazon um, and it's also available um, in your local library. We know that there's a toy course, which is UK based. Um, and it goes into intergenerational practice itself from an international perspective. Um, in the Australian Institute of Intergenerational Practice, if you join, we have monthly nice to wise sessions where it's a research translation. We get our authors to come in and present their paper to make sure you are on top of current research. And we also have connect sessions monthly where we have connect, um, practitioners connecting with each other so that you grow your network because everything in this space comes from social networking. Um, and what we know and how we connect is really important going forward. So we can learn more about AIP by following any of these prompts. We are on Facebook, in, um, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, but just search us on Google if you need to. And that is all I have time for today. But please don't be shy about getting in contact. I would love to hear from you. Here is my details and have a great session. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much to Katrina for, um, for giving us that overview of intergenerational practice because, um, you know, coming from a storytelling perspective, some of you may not be familiar with the intergenerational um, model. Um, so please um, access, you know, those resources, jump onto that website, Australian Institute of Intergenerational Practice, and you can find a wealth of information there. And also certainly reach out through email or through the chat if you've got any questions. All right, so I'm really excited now. I can see Cassie's there with some students from Faith Lutheran College. So welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I would like to, um, I guess, just welcome you and I've actually got a few questions lined up for the students and for Cassie. So um, I had the pleasure of working with Cassie last year on an intergenerational storytelling program um, at Faith Lutheran College, which was working with year seven students. So there was 168 of them. And we had 35 older adults from retirement villages and living in the community. Um, the students are now year eights, which is really exciting. Hi, hi everybody. Good to see you again. And um, I guess I just wanted to take this opportunity to ask a little bit, a few questions about um, the experience that you had of working on the project. So for the students, can one of you tell me, how did you feel about being in the program before you actually started? So when you first heard about the program and working with older adults, what did you think? Um, when I first started, I was nervous because like I had never met these people before. And I guess I was just worried about what was going to happen later. Excellent. Actually, I didn't get the chance for you to all introduce yourself. So can you just quickly say your names one at a time? Tima. I'm Jacob. I'm Trace. I'm Shelby. I'm Genevieve. Right. Welcome. And Cassie, of course. Hi. <laughs> All right. So a little bit apprehensive, but starting to feel more confident as you yeah, got to know the older once adults. We kind of started. I was more like ready to go and more excited about doing it. Excellent. Any other students? Any comments about that? I had my grandma, so my grandma was my buddy. So I was really excited to do the program. Excellent. Yeah, that's great. Any others? 
Oh, how did you feel? Well, I was just like excited all over because like it's just really good experience to meet new people and exp like get a taste of what they experienced through their past lives. Yeah, great, thank you. And of course, you know, when the older adults came to the school and visited the school, they were absolutely mind blown about the the facilities and the the approach to education that happens now. So it was a really great experience for for the older adults as well. And of course, the students got to visit the retirement villages sometime to a, a couple of times to see what it was like there as well. So so again, back to the students. Any of you any comments about? Um, what it was like being in the program and hearing stories from the older adults about their lives. Placed with someone with the same interest as us. My buddy was great. He was a farmer. And um, I really enjoyed hearing about his life. And he wrote a book for his grandchildren and he brought that for us to read and shared that with us. It was pretty nice. Yeah, great. Some interesting stories that he shared. Yeah. Yeah, great. Any anybody else? How did you find hearing stories from the older adults? Um, my buddy was uh, Mr. Our deputy principal's dad, so it was really exciting for us to hear the stories and experiences he went through. And he was in the army, wasn't he? Yeah. So, yeah, so he, he to... went through lots of different experiences compared to other grandparents and. Elderly people. I think he had lots of great stories about being in the army. That yeah, he was more than willing to share. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for that. Any anybody else? Any other comments? What it was like? Um, I had Patricia, and now some of us was nature. So it was pretty easy to connect because lots of things have changed throughout nature through the past like fifty to one hundred years. Yep, excellent. So having sharing those stories about a, an interest that you have in common and comparing what it was like for the older adults in their experience compared to what it's like for you now, was that interesting? Were there some differences? So I've thrown a bit of a curveball here. We, when we were talking with Ray, he told us a lot about what farming was like and how it changed and what it, I told him a bit about what it's like now since I live on a farm and he told us what he did and how he held the land and did his jobs on the farm. Lovely. So you've got that really exchanging your own knowledge and things and your experiences. Lovely. That's wonderful. All right. What what would you say that you enjoyed most about being on the project and being part of it? Something I probably enjoyed the most was when they brought in like the little special items that they loved the most um, and because it helped us to connect with each other, which okay. was really exciting. What did Mr. Kenny bring in? Um, uh -huh. Mr. Kenny brought in his like um, army hat, so it helped him um, remember all the stories with army and everything. Excellent. Thank you. Um, what about any other students? What about what? Did, what else did you enjoy? He brought in all these paintings and showed us all like these different artworks that he's done, and it, like it was outstanding and amazing. And I just thought it was really, I was really appreciated that he brought those in and shared it with us. Lovely. Thank you. Um. I found it really cool about like how school has changed because even though our similar interest was nature, we talked quite a bit about school because Patricia was a teacher when she was working. So it was quite different to see how like she went from basically straight from high school to university for a couple of years, then did teaching full time. And she went to a boarding school, which yes, we still have boarding schools, but we don't see as many as we used to. Did you think it was really I guess it was like a lot more strict back then when they were learning because it was a lot more strict of a schedule like they had to be at certain places at certain times. Excellent. Yeah. Um so I guess I 
have a really good connection with my grandma, but when I was in the story, learning more about her, I guess, really has, I have a really good connection with her now. So I think learning a bit more about her history and what has happened to her. Strengthen that connection. Oh, that's lovely to hear. Thank you so much, um, all of you students, for sharing your experiences. It's wonderful to hear um, things that you've learned and gained from, from that experience. Cassie, I just wanted to ask you, um, what were some of the benefits that you noticed in the students? Yeah, so I guess I wasn't expecting the students to be so nervous when we started the program. Um, you know, we'd been in year seven for a little while and um, they, they seemed like they'd settled right into the school. So I thought they would kind of, you know, approach this with gusto and, and be really excited and enthused, but they were actually quite scared, um, which was surprising. Um, but as they move throughout the program um oh, well once they met their their buddies um and we had placed them in groups based on interest um yeah it just all kind of started coming together and the students just relaxed and the adults obviously relaxed a little bit because they were apprehensive as well but um i think for me as a teacher just their their ability to talk to to others um just improve throughout the course of um of the program because they had to kind of adapt and and learn these skills really really quickly otherwise it was just not going to work every Tuesday um and then to see them interact with other people in the school and their confidence just grow with like older students and teachers that was something that I really noticed um you know at the start and in the first half of the program but certainly by the end of the program but you know it was the first it was an English um history unit and I've taught history for many, many years, and it's kind of the first time that students really do, you know, source analysis, which is a really hard skill. And so for me, they would, you know, take photos of the artifacts that their adult buddies brought in, and they would have to analyze them throughout the week in, in class and, um, and do a little project on the artifacts. And just their ability to analyze was just so much higher because they had this or so much more developed or came so much easier to them because they had this connection with the artifact through something real and so they would have these really rich deep conversations about oh no it's you know their perspective towards this was you know this because remember that they said um that this happened at the time and yeah just these rich discussions so i guess you know, um, in terms of an intergenerational program, that's probably not as important to you guys. But as a teacher, that was something that I was like, wow, OK, I'd never expected that to be a benefit of the program. So, yeah, uh, resilience and confidence definitely in the students um, and their ability to talk to others. And yet uh, their learning was yeah really improved. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Cassie. That's great to hear. And it's interesting to hear the journey from, you know, the start and then seeing how the, the relationships developed over the course of the program. Just one quick question that we've got in the chat. Um, have the older adults and students remained connected? Yeah, so we had um, a, a gallery exhibition for something else at the end of last year. And we had a number of the adult buddies come back to watch or to look at the students' work that they were exhibiting. So they came back and we put on a lunch and, um, yeah, and I didn't know this, that some people had actually kept in contact by email. Um, we had one person, I think it was Nev, who brought back Christmas gifts. And I think, well, I know that they've been invited to Grandparents' Day this year and they're coming back to spend some time some time with the year eights um, for grandparents day and some of them are redoing the program but it will be for the current year seven so yeah there's still definitely those connections there which is really lovely yeah that's great to hear and actually i was visiting the retirement village earlier in the week and one of the residents was saying that she just received a letter from from one of the students yeah. so it's yeah. just so lovely to see all right. Well, look, thank you so much again. I'd love to keep chatting, but we've got to m keep moving on with, with time. So um, if any of the um, people have any questions or anything like that, just pop them in the chat 
and we can certainly pass them on to Cassie and the team or we can do our best to to respond to those questions and comments. But thank you again so much for joining us. All the best students and Cassie and we'll see you again this year. We're doing the program again this year with the new lot of year sevens, which is exciting. Yeah. You'll still see the year eights. <laughs> we'll still see the years. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> see you later. Bye. All right, so our next speaker is Gwen Rayner. So Gwen, do you want to turn your camera on and microphone and share your screen? And then we can jump straight into your presentation. So acknowledgement of country, I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where I'm speaking today, which are the Yugambia people. And I'm going to do this as a rhyme, which is what I do at the beginning of all presentations. When I do a presentation, it goes like this. And I usually use hand movements. I can't show you because you're looking at the screen. So it goes, here is the land and here is the sky. Here are my friends and here am I. So my name is Gwen Rayner and I live at Sea Change Emerald Lakes over 50s resort on the Gold Coast. I am an enthusiastic, committed, a little bit crazy, 100% volunteer, facilitating two intergenerational programs, Golden Life Stories with the local college and the Grandis program with a local early learning centre. I'm also a foundation member of AIIP. The theme for today's Friday 28th of April in Global Inter Intergenerational Week is let's break down barriers. So how can we do this? Now, one way is to tell stories. So why tell stories? So everyone develops skills so they can actively listen, interact appropriately, be entertained, become enlightened, use their imagination. And storytelling plays a vital role in the development of cognitive skills, emotional skills, social skills, in such a way that both children and adults are entertained and enlightened. But storytelling's basic purpose is a vehicle for having fun. Sharing stories should be a positive experience for both the teller and the listener. Next slide. I was going to tell a story here, but I will skip that slide, which is a shame because it's a good story, <laughs> but that's good. So again, some more information about telling stories and that it can be made for individuals, groups, about people and events in their lives. It shows others that you can enjoy being with them. And I think that's one of the most important things is that sense of enjoyment which, with each other and want to spend time with them. And we're all drawn to the nat a natural tendency to draw to the, na the narrative. We tell stories, everybody, every day, if you're in company. And there's a valuable learning lesson for all those outcomes. And the storytelling experience is personal, direct and vital and strengthens the relationships between the storyteller and the listeners, both young and old. It's very active and it brings to life the storyteller's words in their own mind, colored by their own imagination. And it does help to break down barriers. Next. This is an overview of the, a quick overview of the program at Benoa Early Learning Centre, which was planned, and it brings together different generations. So local grandies are invited to attend the learning centre for an hour and a half, approximately once a month at the moment, to participate in various activities with the kindy kids, they're four years old. Next. After the acknowledgement of country, which I started with, um, and we always do it twice because learn, children learn from repetition, the shared session starts with an active retell of a story. As the theme for this session was gardening, I retold the story of the great big enormous carrot, which you can see on the left-hand side, but you couldn't see it at the beginning of the story. 
All participants in the active storytelling were volunteers, both grand grandies and kindy kids. So much laughing, so much fun. Everybody, the whole group, joined in as a team, trying to pull out the enormous carrot, not literally. Grandies connecting with kindy kids, improving relationships and literacy skills. A huge cheer and lots of clapping happened when the teeny tiny mouse finally helped pull up the carrot, which was then taken away to the kitchen and Benoa staff then brought out carrot sticks to be shared with everybody. And of course, the children thought it was from that carrot and we all know that it was only a pretend carrot. Slide eight. As Grandpa had dancing chickens in his garden, everybody joined in the well-loved and active chicken dance. More laughter, more fun, staff, grandies and kindy kids all joining in and getting to know each other. It was lots of fun. I did. Uh, I taught the children that simple dance first. And if you notice in the picture, this is very clever. Some have got red hats and some have got green hats. They were two groups of kindy kids and it's their way of telling the difference. Oh, that's really smart, that place. Next slide. Garden activities followed with much chatter and sharing. Everyone talked about the carrot story and the dance. So you're breaking down the barriers as everybody's got something to talk about. They said, oh, did you enjoy the story? You know, what was the best part? What did you like doing? How about the dance? And some of them even did the whole chicken dance again together outside. Barriers had been broken, leading to togetherness and friendships being formed. Very inter interactive, lots of conversations and learning from each other. Next slide. A reflection on this activity, on the programme. There were four very successful one plus hours of being held at Benoa Early Learning Centre to date. Over 20 grandies have participated in a group storytelling session. In 2022, a Christmas interactive story, and this year, the three kangaroos, Gruff, and the great, big, enormous carrot. After the storytelling session, everybody participates in dancing sessions, singing sessions, playing games and activity time with a group of 40 kindy kids. A delicious morning tea is provided for everyone. So children and adults all sit and have, they continue with the activities. It's not a special time of sitting away. They all just go and get what they like when they like. And all feedback from the sessions has been very positive numbers increase each session. So this shows you that story can help to break down age barriers. I started um, the Golden Story program yesterday and the students that came, all very shy as being told before, these are year 10 students. And I thought, you know what? I should really tell a story for these people. Even when a year 10, I'm sure they would have enjoyed the enormous carrot because it does help to shatter those age barriers and everybody's talking about the same thing. So next slide. She asleep. Thank you. <laughs> I'd just like to say thank you to the staff of Benoa Early Learning Centre, especially Kylie and Joe who have supported the intergenerational programme 100%. Taking risks and reinventing the time to develop and run the programme. And it's been an invest investment of many years of collaboration and teamwork. And the next slide, last slide. Oh, I've got to do. Here is the land and here is the sky. Here are my friends. But it's time for me to say goodbye. And the last slide. The intergenerational project is at Benoa Early Learning Centre and there's the um, details for them and that is me. And remember, I'm just a volunteer. I just do this because I'm so committed to intergenerational practice and doing it and it works wonders. But if you want to write to me, send me an email. I'll be there at the other end. And thank you for listening. And thank you for Danfee.
for helping me get this sorted. Thank you. Yes, yes, I would have loved to hear the story. And I think, yeah, I just, I love this, this idea of the active storytelling and bringing those kind of theatrics in and involving people in the actual story. Um, I think it's just such a wonderful approach. And I think like Gwen says, I mean, the work that she's doing here is for early childhood, but really we all love to get up and have fun. And I, Wendy, are you able to jump on and start your presentation? I will hand you over see? to you. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Nancy. Yes. Can you see my screen oh, okay? Great. All right. Well, Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Wendy Lawrence, and I'm really happy to be with you here today. Before we get started, I would just like to do an acknowledgement of country. In the spirit of reconciliation, I acknowledge and pay respects to the Yagara people and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander traditional owners of country throughout Australia. I recognise their continued spiritual and physical connection to the land, sea, culture and community. Well, thank you so much to, oh, I'm going too fast. I'm a little bit trigger happy here. Thank you so much to Xanthi um, and her team at Bolton Clark for inviting me to speak with you today. Um, as mentioned, uh, my name is Wendy Lawrence. Um, I've recently joined Bupa um, as their National Lifestyle and Wellbeing Consultant, and I'm also an intergenerational facilitator. Um, and I absolutely love and adore working in the intergenerational space and bringing all different age groups together for mutual benefit. Um, I've worked with a number of different organisations developing and facilitating intergenerational programs throughout the years, um, some of which I've popped up on the screen for you today. Um, I'm currently working closely with Greg Cronin, who is the CEO of Intergenerational Learning Australia, um, and I'll share some details about his great program shortly. Um, I also do some separate work behind the scenes um, under the name of Gen Friends with a dear colleague um, and friend of mine, Wen Chi Hu, who also works for Playgroup Queensland. Um, there's lots of things I could talk to you about today, um, <clears throat> but Xanthi has asked me um, specifically to share with you from the perspective of a facilitator, as well as through a storytelling lens, and how we incorporate some of those storytelling elements into the programs that we do. Um, I've got a couple of specific program examples to share with you, some thoughts and tips on activities and preparation. I'm also going to touch on the characteristics of an intergenerational facilitator um, and hopefully if I have time at the end I'm going to share some ideas for um, capturing and celebrating um, all of that beautiful knowledge and experiences and personal stories that often emerge from these programs. Um, so we all know uh, that storytelling is just such an important part of being human and and connecting um, ourselves with with each other and with ourselves personally. Um, working in aged care for a number of years, both in service and management roles, um, I have noticed, and many of us are very aware, of course, that there's been this significant shift in the orientation of care delivery. So we're really moving away from that task-based care um, to much more of a quality-based relationship care, um, which I guess in essence is about putting the person first, having a very genuine knowledge of their life and their experiences and having that commitment to understanding the world from their perspective. Um, the census framework, which I don't have time to go into today, um, it's used by My Home Life in Scotland. If you aren't aware of them, please look them up. They're an amazing organisation and it provides a great framework for this. Um, but this shift speaks very much to the heart of what storytelling is all about, and it also forms the basis of what many intergenerational programs seek to achieve, um, which is why there are and there should be um, such an incredibly important role um, in storytelling in the palm, in the um, role of purse person care. Um, I was going to tell you a story, but I think I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to jump on to the next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm going to talk to you about two specific programs today, which I've helped to facilitate through Intergenerational Learning Australia. 
And the first example that I have here for you is of one of our virtual intergenerational learning programs. Um, this program's been going successfully for a number of years um, as developed by Greg. And um, this slide is specifically in reference to a classroom of year eight students from Coomera Anglican College um, who meet weekly with older participants from various locations. Um, our main group is from a local aged care home, um, but quite often other older people in the community will join us as well. So it's a great outreach program. Uh, the programs predominantly run via video conferencing, um, although we often have some face to face interaction built in um, subject to geography and location. And each session has a formula um, and a format that stays very flexible depending on the dynamics um, of the group. But I think that the most important purpose that we have in every one of these um, interactions is to really encourage that purposeful and reciprocal learning and storytelling between participants. Um, we'll often use a particular curriculum topic as a stimulus for discussion, um, but all the time we're really encouraging that curiosity about each other um, and the joint sharing of lived experiences. Uh, the sessions are recorded, uh, sometimes edited and used as story recordings. Sometimes the students will take notes about new themes and new language learnt, which sort of speaks back to what um, Cassandra was saying earlier on with her students, um, plus any curiosities that they want to know more about. And this often culminates in different outputs that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the next example I wanted to share with you is a program that's been run between 27 residents at Bolton Clark in the Pine um, and in Durbar State School. This was the brainchild of the Deputy Principal Michelle Plank at Endurber. Um, I take my hat off to Zanfi when she was talking about um, just such a large cohort of participants that were working um, in one of her recent programs. Um, this was also quite a large group, so 27 residents and 27 primary school students. Uh, there was a lot of planning that was involved. Most importantly, we wanted to make sure that despite our size, we could still foster that personal connection. Um, so to do that, we paired the students um, and their grandees together. Uh, they came together each week individually, but we also um, had them in smaller groups that stay consistent as well. And a lot of the engagement and sharing of knowledge we do um, is linked to areas such as humanities and social science. Um, but at the heart, again, of what we're wanting to achieve is that sharing you know, of knowledge and experience. And there is no better way to learn about history than from someone who has lived it. Um, so we always have regular time when both the grandees and the students will share their personal stories with each other. Um, they'll often bring photos in, special memorabilia. And in fact, um, in one of the photos down in the bottom right hand corner, uh, there is actually Michelle Plank, um, as well as the principal with a beautiful man called Bob, who's 93 years young. Um, he's got 35 grand and great grandchildren. Um, he was one of our storytellers and the children were just so fascinated to hear about his memories of when he used to go into the, the wilderness um, rounding up the Brumbies as a young man. Um, So here's just a few ideas of things that we can use to help stimulate storytelling and sharing. Um, imagery can be a lovely way to spark conversation. Uh, my home life has got a lovely set of images that we sometimes use for conversation or to scaffold a particular question or topic. The conversation cards, um, there's lots of different types out there, but they are particularly good, especially to help um, break the ice and ease, ease the nerves. And there's lots of different ways that you can use those. Um, also thinking about greeting postcards, letters, um, short videos prior to a program starting can also be a great way to um, build that initial connection. Um, and I think it's really important to remember that the activities are just the stimulus to spark the connection to spark the stories. So the end result of the activity is much less important than what actually happens in between um, and what the stories and the conversation is that's coming out of that interaction. So this slide's just a few examples of activities that really promote the experience of the activity rather than the end product. 
We also like to dedicate quite a chunk of time um, in the planning process to prepare all of the participants. For the students, it's really important. It helps them um, to feel at ease and set them up for success. Uh, we like to do a role play session with them, um, especially for when we run the online programs. And that's a really great opportunity to go through different scenarios, uh, practice the art of good conversation, um, you know, talking slowly and clearly. Um, you know, some things um, which are probably, you know, in, in the age of technology, um, skills that we perhaps don't practice as much. Uh, so we really do put a focus on that in the initial part of the planning. And we also touch on end of life sensitivities and living with dementia, uh, plus lots of other things to help boost their confidence and their understanding. And likewise, we do the same for our older participants as well. Um, so just assuring them that, you know, young children and teenagers are absolutely interested in their personal history and their stories, letting them know a little bit about who they're connecting with. You know, for many, it's probably a long time coming since they may have spent time with a 13 year old. Um, so talking about what to expect, what characteristics they might see, um, you know, often the children are excited and they're nervous. You know, um, some of them might be shy, some of them might be outgoing. And so we spend a lot of time also talking about the important part that the older participants play in being positive role models to the students. And that really speaks back to that beautiful sense of purpose and meaning and engagement. I'm running out of time. Um, so I can't really go into detail here, but just to mention how important it is to foster a really positive and ongoing relationship and collaboration between the teachers and the aged care staff, um, spending time with them and helping them to really um, plan and prepare what they do together. Um, so I'll leave those points for you to go through later. They're all on my PowerPoint presentation. And I just wanted to touch a little bit on the facilitator. Um, there's lots of facilitators within these programs, but I guess there will always be a designated facilita facilitator. I think everyone's got a really important role to play in these interactions, but it's that designated facilitator who really is the glue that brings it all together. Um, I often think that a good facilitator is a little, like, little bit like a duck very calm and unassuming on the surface. Um, the participants might not even realise what they're doing, uh, but behind the scenes, you know, they're paddling really madly, um, you know, helping participants to settle in and make natural con connections and subtly modify activities if they aren't working. Um, I think that good facilitators learn quite quickly um, what support is needed without being overbearing or dominant to let that interaction really be led by the older adults and the students. Um, and flexibility is 100% key. So um, being aware it is more than likely that your first session, your, se your second session, your 10th session, they will run differently to what you expect. That is absolutely fine. It's all part of the magic. It's all part of the journey. Um, Katrina at the start mentioned that there is a great program, the JOY program run by the AIIP, um, which is a fantastic program um, for anyone who's interested in fostering um, intergenerational practice in your organisation or communities or just learning a little bit more about it. Great place to start. Um, and then finally, you know, m most people uh, love to celebrate and recognise um, what they've achieved together. We think that this is an incredibly important chapter um, in every program that we do, whether it's a 10 week program, 10 months or ongoing. Um, so in the programs um, that we facilitate, the students and the older participants will often um, meet to reflect on their time together. That'll culminate in informal presentations, um, handwritten letters or poems. Sometimes they use photo boards as storytelling pieces for participants um, that they can then keep and share. And um, this is my last slide. So just some additional resources about some of the things I've talked about today, um, which I thought might be helpful for you. Um, I have officially run out and over time, I think, but thank you for listening. Um, I hope I've given you some food for thought today um, to either grow or commence your own Intergen programs. And uh, please reach out to me at any time if you would like to chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. A wonderful presentation. And, and I couldn't agree more. The facilitator role is just is so important. And I think, you know, anybody 
um, out there that has skills or you know knowledge and experience working with either older adults or children. It's just a matter of kind of understanding about how to maximise that in engagement between the the generations, and that's what this training um, from the the Joy program or other intergenerational courses can can provide. So jump in and, and learn some more and let's get some more of these programs happening because they're incredibly powerful. Thank you so much, Wendy. But I might just jump straight to Mark um, and the PADSIP team. All right, so Mark, um, can I hand over to you and your team and I'll... Yeah, look, thanks very, very much. Um, let's hope the tech works um, for me as well. Um, great, okay. So look, we've, we're uh, lucky enough to have an <clears throat> amazing team here. And by the way, what a wonderful presentation ahead of us, especially Cassie who um, and Zanti, whose program really we uh, we admire so much to on that sort of scale. Um, we're going to talk t today um, a bit of an a, a um, ambitious task because we've got to we want to uh, feature our team here. Um, which I hope you can um, hear from later. We, I'm going to spend for about 10 minutes talking about this program and then have 10 minutes of the, our panel talking about their experiences. And what I want to do, uh, Georgie and Zanti, is give this full PowerPoint uh, with the recording. So there's a lot of resources on here. Um, and um, so um, we, to get the full benefit uh, of that, you might want to have the PowerPoint so you can click onto the link. So we're um, representing a program that's been going on for about 15 years, the Positive Aging Digital Storytelling Intergenerational Program, and uh, which is based through the Swinburne University uh, uh, Wellbeing Clinic for Older Adults. Um, and I shall acknowledge our country, which I'm actually live in Yakandanda near Albury, which is the Dudaroa people of the Yorta Yorta Nation. And I guess uh, really that 60,000 years of culture at least uh, is present with us now. They're linked to the land, uh, inform us, and uh, the connections that we have, uh, the vertical connections um, and to our roots um, is so important, especially now as we um, have, get a chance to vote in a referendum. So to say a little bit about our clinic, it's a wellbeing clinic for older adults, which is basically a counselling and support program. We offer training for psychologists, social workers and counsellors. Now, I think it's important to say that in mental health, you have direct services and indirect services. And uh, that's important because we, as well as providing a counselling program and a national telehealth program for individuals, groups and families and staff, uh, and research as well. You can see that we've done a, a lot of research as well um, and group programs uh, where we offer um, a family support program, a men's group and reminiscence groups, education and training um, and story work. The intergenerational programs form the indirect approach because unless you have an environment within a residential facility that um, really um, covers the sorts of things that Wendy was talking about, identity, purposes, choice, experience, belonging and relationships, you really need to have that fundamental structure, just like a garden can't grow unless you have the soil and everything around it. You, you, it's, it doesn't exist just on spraying the bugs away. And we also have a, a befriending program too. So no, needless to say, intergenerational programs, as you all know, are programs that are social vehicles um, that actually generate conversations and uh, connections between the generations to build stronger sense of understanding and community, sharing talents, knowledge, wisdom, experience across the ages. Um, you know, this is a no brainer. I think uh, we know that they're all different kinds, as uh, Katrina mentioned, all different kinds of intergenerational programs uh, that have been conceived. And thanks to the AIIP, the Australian Institute of Intergenerational Practice, they're putting all these things together. Now, I think um, one of the things that I think is important is that all programs address problems. They're, whether they're stated problems or implied programs, I think it's behoven of us to say, well, what are the problems being solved? 
And I had to go with this. The issues for older adults, obviously, their problems, you might say, is that they need have to have some sort of isolation, loneliness, lack of purpose and meaning. They need a sense of contribution. They need some sort of con uh, strengthening their identity. They need to uh, have connections with their past as well as their present because people forget who they were and they sometimes, when they have dementia, forget who they were. And there's also a lack of voice. They feel that they're not heard. And the young people as well are harking for connection, especially with, you know, the um, the the COVID situation. They feel often misunderstood and unheard. They often feel disheartened. A lot of people are not engaged uh, within the society, let alone school. They're lonely and isolated. They send. They need to feel that they have some continuity. They feel that they're kind of left loose, like all of a sudden, and they're not connected with anything. There's a lack of self-belief and confidence, and they can't easily find direction. And this is where the uh, problems, I think, uh, the intergenerational programs try and solve these problems through these different kinds of um, programs, really. Now, I'm going through very quickly, as you can see, lots of wonderful resources um, Wendy suggested some as well, which is great. These are the inter international ones. These are the uh, ones that are within Australia, which you can have a look at. Sam Heron's program, you may have heard about in a previous um, webinar as well, is wonderful. The ABC program is just second to none. And you've heard about Greg's program and Wendy's program as well. Um, obviously, Zanti's program is wonderful. And Although not a storytelling one, but certainly one that is going on now that one of our team, Leisha Lee, who is um, doing a PhD in this area, is looking at evaluating. This is a, a co-located um, early childhood centre together with a nursing home through Uniting Age Well. Now, story work we know is powerful and empowering, making emotional connections and linking with values and identity. And I think one of the, the only the best ways of doing this is to ask yourself to do a story in a group. If you have the experience of actually doing a story, and we've been doing this recently where we run a workshop to help people run uh, basically um, a story about themselves, about maybe their transforming moment or a turning point in their life. When you do that, you really realize the power and transformational nature of doing a story. And digital storytelling is simply a, a three-minute kind of shortened version using uh, sound and picture and music or animation to basically uh, create a powerful, um, essential type of story that can communicate emotions. And the process and products are just as important. I mean, Wendy talked about certificates. They're important when you have a a kind of a, a session where you're celebrating what's been created. That's an important point, point but also the process is important. Um, so um, what we're talking about, PADZIP, is really getting together. Many older people have a disability and we find that that's uh, a, a common theme. Many of the high school students also have a disability as well. They have some sort of emotional issues or learning disabilities or neurodiversity and we've been doing really uh, having a lot of experience in this space so the group processes are important because as we all know um, sharing your experience with others and uh, um, where where the issues become separated from the per person and can be looked at together and you realize the connection of your own kind of uh, individual um, disconnection that it has a normalizing um, effect because you basically realize that you're normal. What you're going through isn't some strange, crazy thing, but many other people feel the same way. And there's a lot of strength gained through support. Um, so we no normally have an information launch at this 10 week program uh, within a community setting. We can make it large or small, depending on uh, the fit for purpose. The structure of the programs are usually 10 sessions where we have an introductory development session, uh, production phase, and uh, obviously a post-production phase. This story concept of a story circle, 
which is very important, where you can actually um, have this group identity where you're sharing each other's story and realizing that um, perhaps through discussion, you might want to adapt that story. And it, 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 we've proven that it can be even successful over Zoom, and Greg has as well in Greg and Wendy's program. But when COVID or sometimes residential facilities have got, you know, as well as COVID, they've got, you know, gastro or flu, especially in the winter now, that you can do substitute session to keep the momentum going through, um, you know, um, through Zoom. So the presentation launch is really, really important. You can get the families together. I mean, I saw uh, luckily the one that Cassie did last year in Zanti, and what a beautiful, beautiful thing that that was, where everybody was celebrating, families got to meet each other, and there's a real buzz in the air. Um, it's really a defining ceremony of acknowledgement and the recognition of strong bonds and relationships. So now I'm going to move over to Leisha, if uh, you can get on. Uh, to talk a little bit about the impact of the program, because Leisha has been our research coordinator and has done tremendous work on top of her um, work um, where she has um, done a, a wonderful kind of research aspect to this program and looking at the impact. So, Leisha, hopefully you can get on and I'll uh, drive this couple of slides and you can talk. Great. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, everyone. So uh, my name is Leisha, and yes, I've been coordinating the research and evaluation of this PADSIP program. So as a little edit feature, I'll just take you quickly through how we're evaluating the program and a little sneak peek of um, what we found so far. Um, so evaluation is really important, um, has a few important roles. You know, we want to find out what sort of impact the program is having and have that documented so that we can really build a case for the program to get more funding, support from government, and from a more academic side of things. Um, we want to understand whether the program works, in what ways it works, you know, what needs to be worked on um, and to build an evidence base for our current and future practice. So as Marks mentioned, we set up this research project for the PETSIP program um, about two years ago. And we've currently, we currently have about 30 data sets from our older adults. Um, so our aims are really to check in on how feasible the program is. So how through how many people complete the program, how acceptable it is through how satisfied our participants report um, to be, and also what sort of impacts we were seeing in people after they participate in the program. So you looked at that in terms of their psychosocial health and attitudes towards aging. So we used, in terms of our study design, a quasi-experimental pretest post-test design, which in layman terms, if we just ask our participants before the program, a few questionnaires. These are validated outcome measures um, addressing different aspects of their psychosocial health, like loneliness, depression symptoms, their satisfaction with life, attitudes towards aging. And then after the program, we ask them the same questions. And we also ask them how satisfied they were with the program through a program satisfaction survey and conduct either an interview or a focus group with them to ask them more in-depth questions about their experiences. So on the next slide, I'll see um, this is some preliminary preliminary findings um, from the last two years for 17 of our older adults. What you're basically seeing are those um, psychosocial outcome measures that we spoke about. So in the light pink are the, the scores before the program and the darker pink is after the program. So we are seeing increases where we'd like to see them. So in terms of ego integrity, identity validation, satisfaction with life, we're seeing that increase. We've got a statistically significant one for those of us who are interested in facts here um, for identity validation. And we're seeing decreases where we hope to see them. So in terms of loneliness and scores of um, depression symptoms, which is really promising. And hopefully that trend continues as our data set grows and we'll make a good case out of this. So um, for the non-numerical people, this might speak more to you um, from our interviews and focus groups. These are a few quotes from that illustrate some sentiments that our participants have about the program. So here we have some of what older adults say. We're a bit short of time, so um, when we share these slides, you can take your time and look through them. Um, but we, it really illustrates how much um, the older adults enjoyed and what they got out of the program. And over the next two slides, we also have some quotes from younger people, um, which are very 
illuminating really to show um, the changes in attitudes that you have towards older adults through the program. And on the, the next slide, we also see what some of our staff, educators and our volunteers who are involved in the program today. Um, so hopefully you'll enjoy that in your own time. But for now, I'll pass it back to Mark. Thank you. OK, just again, a uh, big of time and we want to give Gwen a bit of a chance to to speak. Uh, these are you can see over the 15 years that we've done these programs. It's you know, you want for the, all of you not in Melbourne, you probably won't understand all these places, but there's been quite a variety of services. And for the first time where I am in Yakandanda, we're actually developing a program with a local grade sixes, which will be very, very exciting getting the community involved as well. Um, we have we're starting a website. You you'll you'll be able to see, and if we have time, we've got a four minute little video we can show at the end. As anti, if there is only if there's time, I won't show it now. And uh, what I want to do now is stop sharing. Uh, if I can end the show, um, uh, where am I? That's right. Go here. Stop sharing. Yes, and invite our team, whoever's on. I can't see everybody, but we've got wonderfully Leisha, who you've just heard from, and Craig, who is uh, one of the wonderful teachers who I've had a partnership and friendship with for 15 years. Good on you, Craig. Philippe, who is um, one of our participants, and thank you so much, Philippe, for uh, going on. And uh, Therese, who's been one of our wonderful coordinators of the program. Uh, so let's hear from them. I'm going to ask, uh, first of all, probably Craig to talk about a little bit about your role and experience and maybe a little bit about the benefits and challenges and any future suggestions. So over to you, Craig. Um, and then I'll go over to Philippe and uh, Therese. So, Craig, over to you. Thank you, Mark, for the opportunity. So I'll, I'll try to be as succinct as I can with this. So um, as Mark uh, said, I've been working with this program with Mark for about 15 years now, since 2007. Um, so I'm working at um, Auburn High School, so it's a um, co-educational uh, government school in Hawthorne, Victoria, here in Melbourne. Um, and our program over the year years has worked with students in year seven, eight, nine, and ten um, in uh, media arts classes program within that curriculum within um, the English class and <clears throat> humanities. So that's been exciting to um, be flexible and adapt the program at the different year levels. Um, we've been working with adults, older adults from our local area here, um, living independently and also in residential care, which has been wonderful. Um, and what has been really important in the success of the program is having uh, or developing the really strong links with the um, external organisations such as the Swim Swinburne University, the Wellbeing Clinic for um, older adults. So with the um, Mark and the amazing team there, certainly with the support of having um, adults to uh, facilitate um, the discussions and programs at, at the school end. That's been um, integral to our success. Um, in terms of uh, benefits, I think for what I've sort of borne witness to with the, the students here. Certainly the um, uh, engagement in, in, in the program. So it's something different to the, the usual that's going on in the classroom. It's a wonderful 10-week um, program, 10 to 15 week program that we run here. Um, what's uh, been lovely to see is the, um, apart from the um, immediate session where the older and younger people have the getting to know one another. What's interesting to note is the um, the anticipation in the lead up to the sessions and the conversations that go on here at school, but also the, the, the conversations that occur beyond the session, <coughs> excuse me, amongst the students and also the conversation this, I'm hearing from parents, the students having with the, the parents when um, Often at that age, um, 
there's not a whole lot of uh, meaningful conversation or deep conversation happening from, from the teenagers at home. A couple of grunts here and there. So that's been a, a lovely thing to, to see. Um, uh, from the student's point of view, um, that idea of really breaking down the stereotypes has been a powerful thing. Um, their perception, students' perceptions of what um, getting older is is like, because sometimes from the kids' experiences, it might be just that one or two um, grandparents or older people, and that's their primary experience of uh, what happens in ageing. So being introduced to a, a much broader range of possibilities um, of um, what positive ageing is all about is the power of the program. Um, and also the, um, perhaps to wrap up here, the the, um, the legacy of, of the project that follows through, because we worked with developing three to five minute digital stories, short little video clips, and um, for the um, older adults and the younger students and for the, their broader families to have this legacy item um, to carry through is a, a wonderful um, moment to capture. So um, in terms of going forward in the future, I'd certainly love to um, begin exploring possibilities of projects um, linking up nationally and internationally um, to, to broaden um, the sessions that we run. But um, Yes, I think that's the main point. Right. So, Look, Craig, thank you, thanks a lot. I'm aware of time. Yeah. So just a few words from Philippe and Therese. Philippe, um, just to, what might capture um, your experience, Philippe? Because I know we've talked about how um, really wonderful you felt having an impact on the kids, really, as well, perhaps surprising ones. Do you want to share some a little bit of that <laughs> flavour, Philippe? <laughs> OK. Um yeah, actually, one of the kids called me cool, and I thought, <laughs> oh wow, at my age to be cool. I thought, <laughs> I thought that was wonderful. <laughs> um, I found it really interesting. The students, in particular, uh, what, there are a couple of things that really got to me. One, they're all taller than me, and they're only thirteen, <laughs> and I thought I was reasonably tall. <laughs> uh, uh, also, they tried to be very cool uh, in the beginning, but as the sessions moved on, they became themselves. And it was really fascinating because they look older, people expect them to be older, but in actual fact, they're still kids. Uh, and I got to see them as kids playing out in the playground and doing pretty stupid things. But <clears throat> when I look back on my own life, I probably did pretty much the same myself, <laughs> if the truth be known. Uh, no, I really enjoyed the sessions. It uh, And Craig was uh, a great backup to all of this. Um, and so was Lisa as well. Both mm -hmm. of them were terrific. Mm -hmm. You're lucky to have such a good team, uh, Mark. Yeah, we are. Uh, Look, we might move, move on, Philip. Sorry, um, I no, know Santi's okay. wanting time. And I wanted Therese to have maybe the final word because, you know, thank you so much, Therese. You, you've taken this on. Chaos is the summary. Uh, chaos <coughs> turned to beauty, I think, is summarising your role um, because you start off with, my God, what? how do I change tack? Because people are sick. People don't turn up. You know, clo lo closure of a facility, you know, and you've had to change many times. How? What's been maybe a couple of anecdotes about the the beauty of this program, or what keeps you at it? Well, my observations are that as you get older, your world shrinks, and especially for people who are in an aged care facility, their world is substantially smaller than it was. And what this program does is it helps people to expand their world again. And it connects them to parts of themselves they might have forgotten. It connects them to sometimes a sense of humor, which they might not have used before. And it gives them a sense of joy. And that is one of the most satisfying things is to know that you've been part of um, or instrumental in making that happen for a group of people. Um, so that's, uh, I'd say that's my motivation, despite many challenges and despite having to um, 
uh, find all the flexible parts of my personality and bring them to the fore. <laughs> it's the pleasure that one gets from supporting and um, giving, uh, you know, giving other people pleasure. Look, thanks very much. Over to you, Zanti. I know we're out of time. And uh, thank you for my team, my team. I don't, it's not my team, it's your team. And it's a wonderful bunch of people. I've been so honoured and privileged to work there. And a good segue, Zanti, to, to Gwen, because I know joy and uh, fun are the backbone of Gwen. So over to you, Zanti. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. And thank you so much, the team, the PADSIP team. Um, it's an incredible project. And I love that finishing off, you've got to be flexible with these kinds of programs because you just never quite know what's going to happen. And that's actually part of the fun part of it. You know, as much as it is hard for us to let go of trying to control everything, but in this, you just have to let it, let it happen. Probably the key message in all of these programs, in all storytelling programs and in all intergenerational programs especially, is is we want this to be fun and have a positive experience. Um, so, you know, I think that's really, really important. Um, we have unfortunately reached the end of our time and I was so determined this time to make sure we had plenty of time for the Q&A, but once again... We've, we've unfortunately run out of time for that. So please, um, please reach out to us. Um, send us an email. Um, we are more than happy to pass anything on to any of the uh, people that spoke today. A massive thank you to all of our speakers that, that we've had today. Um, incredible presentations once again. And thank you all so much for, for joining and supporting these webinars. Um, the recordings will be available and you'll receive an email when they're, when you'll be able to access that recording. So um, enjoy the rest of your day and please watch out for our next series of, of webinars and um, yeah, all the best. Thank you. Bye.